refer to the Common Core State Standards Initiative, a set of national standards in English and math. Those are the two subjects that are already implemented. Science has been written, and the history curriculum is all but finished now. And they're even more problematic than math and English. We've you may have heard, if you've been paying attention to Common Core, you may have heard some of the horror stories surrounding Common Core English, Common Core math. And I know, uh, being from Texas, you, how many of you are familiar with CSCO? Uh, or at least this controversy surrounding CSCO, which was a forerunner of Common Core. So you've had a lot of these uh, really sort of crazy assignments in Texas schools already anyway. And the real problem we have with that statement, even the opening statement, they call it the Common Core State Standards Initiative. And that would lead you to believe that the states actually had something to do with it. Uh, there's so many things about Common Core that are just as honest, and this is the first one. You keep hearing from pro-Common Core people that this is a state-led initiative. That's a shockingly inaccurate claim. States have nothing to do with this. The states weren't consulted about this. All of this was done behind closed doors. Nobody in any state had a real chance to look at Common Core after the standards had been conceived, drafted, revised, paid for, uh, validated, and put in 44 states in the union. Only after that did people at the state level begin to see them. So the idea that they call it the State Standards Initiative is typical. It's typical of how Common Core is proceeded. Uh, the idea that this is a, a state-led thing, the idea that this isn't federal, the idea that Common Core is going to allow a lot of state and local control over what happens, it's all not true. Um, and again, the only thing we have to compare this to, so I will make reference to it a couple of times over the course of the talk, the only thing we have comparable to this takeover of education is the healthcare takeover. It's all fresh in our memories. And if you think about how transformational the healthcare legislation is going to be, how many different aspects of American life are going to be altered uh, um, irrevocably by the health care law. This is every bit as transformational as that, only it's completely under the radar screen. Nobody knows about it. So it is an abbreviated term. The Common Core State Standards Initiative, National Standards for English and Math, Science and History forthcoming. This is a shocking thing. It was written and copyrighted by two Washington lobbyist groups. Two Washington lobbyist groups with uh, and no appreciable ties to education themselves are the ones responsible for this. And when you hear the National Governors Association, one of those lobbyist groups, it's tempting to think, isn't it, that, oh, well, that doesn't sound too bad. 50 state governors locked themselves in a room and banged out education standards. If that had happened, we'd be better off, simply because you can unelect a governor, right? If one of the governors, if 50 governors produce this, you have a means to alter that legislatively. Problem is, the people who did this aren't accountable to the government. These two lobbyists, I'll give you an example of this, to show you how disconnected the governors themselves are from the NGA. The sitting president, the sitting chairperson of the National Governors Association is the Oklahoma governor, Mary Fallon. And Mary Fallon, just about a month ago, pulled Oklahoma out of Common Core. So another talking point you hear from the pro-Common Core people is that, oh, this is led by the states, not true. This is led by the governors, it's not true. There's not a governor in this country who had any say in these standards, or even got to see them. So the National Governors Association and the CCSSO, these are the two organizations. And there's a, a, a great article that's been written by Joy Pullman at the Heritage Institute, Harvard Institute, that traces the writing of Common Core, the drafting of the standards, back to five people, five individuals in these two groups. These five individuals, the chief of whom is a man by the name of David Coleman, David Coleman, C-O-L-E-M-A-N, -E he, he is called the architect of Common Core. He was a roommate of Arne Duncan, your secretary of education in college. That's his only qualification to have done this, basically. David Coleman and his five, four confederates, they wrote this behind closed doors Common Core standards. Who paid for this? The Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Way back in 2008 and 2009, Bill and Melinda Gates put up $150 million initially to pay these two lobbyist groups to craft these standards. As we sit here today, Bill and Melinda Gates have spent over $4 billion on Common Core, advertising it, promoting it, propagandizing it. In fact, if you look at the national educational organizations who support Common Core, every one of them has been paid by Gates, every single one of them, to the tune of millions and millions of dollars. I'll give you an example. Uh, the National Parent Teachers Association, the National PTA, was handed million-dollar grants from the Gates Foundation before the standards were even written. And so the national PTA was advertising for the standards before they'd even seen what they were. And this is where we find ourselves. And you ask yourself a question about this. What qualifies any of these people to do this? What gives them the authority to do this? Common Core was not written primarily by teachers. 
the educational uh, university professors of education, of English, of math, the subjects that we have of history, had no say in these standards. All of this was done sort of covertly, behind closed doors. We asked, I mentioned the Affordable Care Act, and the question becomes, well, if the federal government wanted to take over education, why didn't they just do it the way they did it with health care? And the answer to that is, is that legally they couldn't. Because of a 1965 federal statute, the federal government is prohibited from creating a national uh, curriculum or national standards. They can't do it. So they did the next best thing. The five people responsible chiefly for Common Core are all deeply associated with the federal government, with President Obama, and with Secretary of Education Arnie Duncan. They went behind closed doors, wrote these standards, paid for by the Gates people. But now think about that. That's bad enough. And I'm going to show you, jumping ahead here. Here's the copyright. To me, this is absolutely stunning. The copyright for the educational standards that are transforming the country is owned not by the federal government, not by uh, teachers' unions, not by the states, not by the moms and dads. It's owned by these two small Washington lobbyist groups. The NGA Center and the CCSSO shall be acknowledged as the sole owners and developers of the Common Core State Standards, and no claims to the contrary shall be made. So if we as a nation don't like the Common Core Standards, if we don't like what they're doing to our public schools, to our children, how do you reach them? No, not, no one in the, these two organizations has ever been elected to public office. They can't be traced. They can't be, there's no way you can get them. Legislatively now, this is transforming your schools. But you can't reach these people. That's the bait and switch. Because I don't care how much money Bill Gates has, he can't buy himself into your public schools. He could not have put these educational standards in the American schools without the help of the federal government. I've already suggested to you that the feds are unable to do it legally, so they did the next best thing. These uh, very close associates of theirs wrote the standards. Gates paid for them. But how did they get into your schools? Does anybody remember President Obama's Race to the Top program? Remember hearing about Race to the Top? What was Race to the Top? Race to the Top was a federal program. Remember back in 08 and 09 when the president was stimulating everything? Bailing out banks, bailing out car companies. Well, one of the things the president did is he set aside about $6 billion in American taxpayer money and gave it out to state education departments by way of grants called Race to the Top. 46 states in the union eventually took Race to the Top money. To give you an example, the state of New York applied for a Race to the Top grant in 2009, won one. New York was given $700 million in 2009. All that money went directly to the Education Department in New York. And do you know what the only proviso for taking that money was, the only condition? Any state that took Race to the Top money was obligated to take the Common Core State Standards when they were finally written. And that's how 46 American states got Common Core without ever seeing what was in it. 46 states without seeing it. That's, when we say it's a federal curriculum, it's federal standards, that's the argument. They'll tell you it's not. People who are for it will point to this copyright and say it's not owned by the federal government. And do you see how that benefits the federal government? A, legally they couldn't do it. B, when you accuse them of trying to take over education at the federal level, they point to this and say it's not true. But the only reason 46 states have it, without ever having seen it first, is because the federal government gave them money and told them if you take this money, you have to adopt the standards. That's the story. So nobody even knew what it was when it was adopted. Now ask yourself this question. I know my answer to this. I suspect I know yours as well. Do you think the people who support Common Core right now would continue to support it? if there were the exact same set of standards, if instead of Bill and Melinda Gates and their billions of dollars, what if it was uh, the Koch brothers, the evil Koch brothers, right? And what if instead of a, two very left-leaning Washington lobbyist groups, you had two right-leaning ones who constructed these standards behind closed doors? And what if instead of a very liberal president, you had a very conservative one, who basically bribed 46 states to take a set of curriculum standards that they hadn't seen? Do you think the people supporting them now would still support them? See, I don't. I'd be opposed to them, absolutely opposed to them if it happened that way. This is how it happened. And this is, quite frankly, this is banana republic stuff. This is utterly unaccountable, utterly unelected people with no serious educational background have succeeded in taking over major aspects of what your kids are going to learn and how they're going to learn. And as we've seen, even in a state like Texas, one of the four states that refused to take the standards 
the educational superstructure in your state is putting it in the schools anyway. Teaching the lessons anyway, in spite of what the legislature says, however illegal it may be. What's the, what's the end game here? These are the standards. These are, this is how we got it. What I'd like to start with is the sad reality is the only top argument you get when you point this out to them, the only argument you get from pro-common core people when you try to explain these things is that anybody who opposes common core is just a right-wing hysterical wingman. That's pretty much it. The entire argument to try to refute what critics, and there are critics, you know, Alice has been working on this for a long time, there are thousands of people across the country, university professors like myself, trying to warn people what this is going to do to American education. And the only cogent answer you get from them is, well, you're just a right winger. I would like to take a few moments and show you who are some of the right wingers who oppose Common Core. Let's start with the two chief lawyers of the Department of Education when this scheme was proposed back in 2009. The two top lawyers of the Department of Education resigned over Common Core, calling it a illegal federal takeover of public education. We understand too, right? You don't get to be the top lawyer at the Department of Education if you're a right winger. We get that. These two guys quit. Here's what they said. In imposing the Common Core standards and the aligned tests on the states, the federal government is violating three statutes and has put America on the road to a national curriculum. That's the second thing that makes the federal mission. Only the feds could have done it, and that's raised to the top, number one. And number two, you've got the tests. These tests that all American school kids are going to have to start taking next spring, all that testing data goes right to the federal government. It doesn't come to the states. It doesn't come to the schools. The feds collect all that information. They run the tests. They oversee them. That's the second reason it's federal. The New York State United Teachers, a union that represents more than 600,000 educational professionals in the state, is also asking the Board of Regents to remove State Education Commissioner John King from office. And although the union previously bent <coughs> the standards, the union says it will not support the education bench benchmarks, quote, as implemented or interpreted. Not the way you're doing them, and not if you fix them. New York State Teachers Union wants out of it now because they've seen it in ways that you haven't seen it here in Texas and ways that other states who, have taken, who still have Common Core haven't seen it. And then how about, besides the New York State Teachers Union, how about the largest teachers union in the nation? How about the NEA, the National Education Association? This is the not only is it the largest teachers union in the, in the country, it is the single most powerful union in the country right now. Since the UAW has had its feathers plucked a little bit, this is the most powerful union in the country. They spend more on lobbying and political activism than any union in the country. And here, again, is that an, is this an organization you could write off as a right-wing shill group? Huh? Right. Is this the John Birch Society? Right? right. Yeah. No, it's not. It's, here's what the uh, NEA said. And notice the date, February of 2014. The nation's largest teachers union is pulling back on its once enthusiastic support for the Common Core academic standards, labeling their rollout, quote, completely botched, unquote. <laughs> National Education Association President Dennis Van Roekel said, quote, the standards will not succeed without a major course correction, including rewriting some of the standards and revising the tests with teacher input. Think about that for a second from the right-wing uh, NEA president, right? He just told you that these tests that are going to be measuring and gathering data on their kids, they weren't written by teachers. They will not be administered by teachers, and they will not be graded by teachers. So you're going to hold teachers accountable for a set of standards that they have no input on the test? Van Roekel's right. The teachers have no say in any of this. This is not a teacher-led movement. Teachers weren't consulted on this when it was put into place. Teachers have no ability to change, alter, or even look at the tests. That's why the, the NEA is having problems with it. And the standards themselves, he tells you, have to be rewritten with actual teacher input. Who did this? Who allowed them to do this? Go a little bit further. More right-wingers. This is my personal favorite. How about the Chicago Teachers Union? President Obama's own backyard. 
This is the most, this is the most progressive radical uh, teachers union in the country. These are the same people that five years ago voted in a curriculum that would begin teaching five-year-olds how to masturbate in public schools, showing them how to do it. That's what they voted for five years ago. The woman there at the bottom of the picture, that's Karen Lewis. She is the president of the Chicago Teachers Union. This woman is way to the left of Bill Ayers. If you ever bumped into her on the street and said, hey, Karen, love your work. I think you're a bigger leftist than Bill Ayers. She would thank you for the compliment. She's got her own Wikipedia page. It's staggering how progressive this woman is. And yet, listen to what she had noticed today, May of this year, a couple months ago. Here's what Karen Lewis said in President Obama's own backyard about Common Core. Quote, I agree with educators and parents from across the country. The Common Core mandate represents an overreach of federal power into personal privacy as well as into state educational autonomy. Those are big, big deals. People like me who aren't radical progressives, we've been saying this for a year, no one listens, right? But when someone is, to, she's to the left of President Obama, when someone like her says it, people should start paying attention because that seems to be the, the benchmark of proof for our media, right? When the left comes out against something, and listen to the two major points that she makes. It is an overreach of federal power into personal privacy. This is the data mining component. This is how the federal government is going to use the schools now to pull out all sorts of remarkable information. And it's not just through Common Core, although that's a big platform for them. It's also the health care law. If you read the 27,000-page Obamacare health care law, there are all sorts of places in it that mandate the schools to become information gathering uh, stations in the name of your child's educational health. Right. This is Karen Lewis. It is an overreach of the federal government into personal privacy and into state educational autonomy. And what that means is the song and dance you keep getting from the supporters of Common Core in this state is a lie. She's telling you, she's right, that if this gets, goes through, you will not have any more state autonomy. You won't be able to fix things. Right now in your schools, if you have a problem with a book that's being read or a movie that's being shown, you can go to your teacher, and 99 times out of 100, you can opt your kid out of that, no questions asked. If all of this now, if the whole curriculum now is orchestrated by the federal government, and every aspect of it is going to be tested nationally to a set of standards, <laughs> how in the world are you going to opt your kids out of anything? You go to your teacher. You don't want your kid reading that book. Your teacher can't opt you out. It's a national standard. Your principal can't opt you out. Your school boards can opt you out. Governor Perry can't opt you out, because the whole thing now is federal. What do you do then? That's what is at stake here with this. Educational autonomy itself. She goes on to say, and I quote, Common Core eliminates creativity in the classroom. Well, of course it does. Any teachers here today? Do you know that if you've been teaching, right? You know there are times you have to throw the books out. Are there not times you have to get, go completely off the reservation? Don't certain kids need a complete shakeup? How can you do any of the things that you have to do as a creative teacher to get to the kids that you have? Forget the kids. You're in Texas. Forget the kids in Washington State. Forget the kids in Wisconsin. You can't help them. You can only help the 30 kids sitting in front of you. And they all have very different backgrounds and very different needs. You're telling me some bureaucrat in Washington understands that better than you do? Why does she tell you it eliminates creativity? Because it's a lesson plan that's handed to you. You have only one way to do it. And if the only way your job performance as a teacher is measured is by these ridiculous standardized tests, then you darn well better teach the test. And that's been going on in this country for 50 years. Ever since the creation of the Department of Education in the late 70s, the Department of Education had to justify its existence. And how did it justify its existence? By devolving more and more of what goes on in education to the federal government, to itself. We've had standardized testing for about 40 years now. It has never worked. And every time it fails, including No Child Left Behind, which was the previous iteration of this. And to be fair, who gave us No Child Left Behind? George W. Bush, right? Now, of course, George W. Bush didn't write No Child Left Behind. Who did? John Boehner. Not John Boehner. H.R. 1. Teddy Kennedy. 
You think about that. George Bush is reviled as this uber right-wing Nazi kind of guy. George Bush allowed the most liberal member of the Senate, Ted Kennedy, to write No Child Left Behind. And it was a screeching disaster. In fact, ever since we institute, we insisted that the only way to measure student performance was these absolutely monolithic standardized tests. Schools have gotten worse, kids' grades have gotten worse, performance has gotten worse. Well, I'm going to tell you right now what Common Core is to start with. Common Core is No Child Left Behind on steroids. Mm -hmm. The worst aspects of No Child Left Behind, the one-size-fits-all education, the standards-based education. And I, the, I, let's, let's talk about standards here for a minute. One of the arguments you get is that if you don't support Common Core, then you just don't want standards in your schools. Right? How could you be against standards? Remember when we went to the Affordable Care Act nonsense and they told you, if you don't support the Affordable Care Act, you want people to die in the streets? <laughs> and do you remember when we were going through this whole war on women's shtick? If you don't support the, the latest radical progressive uh, abortion agenda, it's a war on women, that's what they do to you. If you don't support, and it's true of, the right, it's true of Republicans and Democrats over the last 40 years, if you don't support big government programs, then the only answer is you want people to die. The fact is, Education, by definition, is standards, isn't it? If you're teaching kids and giving them quizzes or tests or grades or you're evaluating the behavior, you're ha engaging in standards. The idea that we've had no standards in education till this nonsense came along, it's absurd. We've always had standards. The standards aren't the problem. It's these standards that are the problem and everything that comes with them. And do you really believe, how many of you have kids or grandkids? Okay, all of them. So can you get your five daughters or your seven grandkids, can you get your children to perform at exactly the same level in every single subject area across the state? You're already laughing at me. You can't do it. And if you can't do it with your six, five, three kids, how in the world are you going to do that with 60 million American school kids? And I can tell you already understand how this works. If you are going to insist that 60 million American kids are always on the same page, that every third grader in this country will know the same things. If you don't insist that, are you going to have to high lower the standards or raise them? Lower. They have to lower them over and over again. And that's what happened over 12 years of No Child Left Behind. It doesn't matter where these stand. I'm going to show you in a few minutes that these standards aren't that high. Actually, they're quite weak. But even if you, whatever standards you start with with this kind of education, inevitably you have to lower them. You can't raise standards and drag more kids with you. If the only way you can get more and more kids to the same place is if the standard is lower. You know this, it makes sense. And yet, and yet for 40 years in this country, we have insisted that the only way to educate our kids is by this kind of one-shot one high-stakes test. The only way to evaluate whether they succeed or not. It is absurd. If you can't get, let me defend teachers for a moment. If you can't get your four kids to the same place in every subject, how can you ask teachers who have 30, 40 new kids every semester, how can you ask them to do it? It's impossible. No Child Left Behind, National Standards, written by Teddy Kennedy, among others. Think about this for a second. One size fits all education. If we're going to get every kid to the same place, don't we have to ignore the strengths and weaknesses of kids? Those kids who can really do certain subjects, not every, there's no kid in this country who can do every subject that well. No one. And so the only way you get them to the same place is if you hold back the ones who can excel. Okay? Do you know that we've lost more gifted and talented programs in this country in the last two years than in the previous 40 years combined? Because in this kind of standards-based education, when you have this arbitrary national standard, you cannot have kids accelerating the standard any more than you can have them falling behind it. As a matter of fact, kids who accelerate the standard are a bigger problem for things like Common Core. Jason Zimba himself has pointed out that we would rather have kids fall short of the standard than exceed it, because you can always lower them. How many of you remember over the No Child Left Behind dozen years? How many of you remember back in 2006 and 7 and 8 what was going on in places like New York and Atlanta, Georgia and North Carolina? You remember when teachers, principals, and even two superintendents of schools were taking the kids' standardized tests and throwing them in the trash and were forging new tests. They had to, because if you're a teacher who doesn't get their kids to the standard, you may not get tenure, you may not be reappointed. If you're a principal whose school fails to meet the standard every year, you can be reassigned. When we say, when we say high stakes testing, what we mean is high stakes for the schools. And if you're a teacher or a principal and a superintendent, 
And the only way you're being evaluated in these absurd tests that are crafted out of Washington, what are you going to make damn sure that you're only teaching your kids? It's what's on those tests. Is teaching kids to take specific tests teaching them anything? And yet this is what education is reduced to. And we wonder why it keeps work, it keeps failing. And every time it fails, like with no child left behind, what do we do? We roll out more extreme standards, bigger tests, more complicated tests, that's the answer. When has the federal government ever looked at a big government program, saw that it failed, and went the other way? They always go more the same way, right? And it's not rocket science, this is your problem. For the last 40 years, the, the, the ability of teachers, moms and dads, and kids to interact has been more impeded, more blocked, more separated, more regulated, more tested, more orchestrated. And it's been a disaster. That's what she's telling you. Common Core eliminates creativity in the classroom, and it impedes collaboration. How can moms and dads and teachers and kids work together with all this bureaucratic, insistent nonsense hanging over their heads? It impedes collaboration. I love this. We also know that high-stakes standardized testing is designed to rank and sort our children, and it contributes significantly to racial discrimination and the achievement gap in America's schools. And she's right. You know the biggest point of agreement between the left and the right of Common Core is what this does to inner-city kids and special needs kids. These kids are doomed under Common Core. And no one really cares. And so that's what she's telling you. Not only did the CTU, the Chicago Teachers Union, say this, they unanimously, the union, voted on a series of resolutions condemning Common Core. I can't show you all of them, but I'll just show you a couple of them. Here's from the CTU resolution. <coughs> the CTU resolution declares that, quote, instructional and curricular decisions should be in the hands of classroom professionals, i.e. teachers who understand the contexts and interests of their students. That is so common sense, I'm sort of stunned that Karen Lewis's group said it. <laughs> Think about that. Curricular decisions and how to teach should be left in the hands of teachers. But it wasn't for Common Core. She also says, the resolution also says, that education of children should be grounded in developmentally appropriate practice. Not only do teachers not have a say in this, and if you've been paying any attention at all, certainly with Cisco, do you remember how many shockingly uh, inappropriate lesson plans there were? How much sex and graphic violence was in your kids' textbooks? That's what she's talking about. We're going to talk about that in a moment, too. Why is so much of it there? And it's all standard-based. So you can't get out of teaching that joke. They go on to say, Common Core standards were developed by non-practitioners, non-teachers. This isn't right-wing Duke has to say in this. Right? Because that seems to be the only argument they ever make about people who speak out. This is Karen Lewis. You've heard two Department of Education liberals, two liberal Department of Education lawyers. You've heard the New York State Teachers Union. You've heard the president of the NEA. You've heard Karen Lewis and the Chicago people here. Right? Fine, ignore the right wingers. But tell me what you make of this. Because I said this a year before she started saying it. Alice said this a year before these liberals came out and started saying, what else happens here? Developmentally appropriate. These tests, these standards were developed by non-practitioners, including, there's your problem, tests and curriculum publishers. As, I, I'll show you, as, as one of my, my other liberal voices I'll show you in a minute points out, there's no money. Textbook companies cannot make money if a textbook works. If a tech, we've been teaching math for 2,500 years of this in the West, we've taught math the same way. 2,500 years. And it gave us, uh, it gave us Pythagoras, excuse me. Gave us Pythagoras, gave us Einstein, gave us Galileo, gave us Newton. And remember in the 70s, you're younger about mine, tell me about mine. Remember in the 70s when we first got new math? Does that make it sound like math changed all of a sudden? That hey, in the 1970s, we discovered an alternative <laughs> mathematical reality. Nonsense. <laughs> All that meant was, by the time we got to the late 70s, textbook companies realized that the federal government, with the creation of the Department of Education, was now spending billions of taxpayer dollars on the schools, and they wanted some. And so who was it that determined that American schools were failing? It wasn't teachers, and it wasn't students, and it wasn't the tests that we had. 
It was education companies. Because the more kids fail, the more you have to buy new books and new textbooks and new exams. And so every five years or so since the late 1970s, we deem the current system a failure. Billions and bi hundreds of billions over the last 50 years have been spent rolling out the next new thing. And every school has to buy it. Don't you think it's interesting that before anybody in Texas knew what Common Core was, before your legislature had any idea what it was, your schools had already paid hundreds of millions of dollars buying Common Core textbooks? Mm -hmm. right? That's the problem. Common Core standards were developed by non-practitioners, including test and curriculum publishers. And education reform foundations, like the Gates Foundation, the Broad Foundation, Achieve Inc. In fact, every single one of them, you look at those groups, I can give you a list of 50 more, right? All of them, to a group, have been paid hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars by Gates to educate, to, to, to advocate for these kind of educational changes. Do you know that it's been estimated that about 70% of American school districts, 70 across the country, are going to have to upgrade their technology either a little or a whole lot to be able to do the kind of common core testing that's required? <laughs> Whose computers do you think are going into school? Do you really think they're going to have Apple, Apple computers? No, they're all Gates computers. The idea, and look, that's why I brought up the Koch brothers. Because Gates is a leftist billionaire who contributes to leftist causes. Nobody in the educational arena challenges him. If any other billionaire in this country, had, with the possible exception of George Soros, had done this, can you imagine if it were the Koch brothers? Harry Reid's head would explode all over the Senate floor. And yet, because this guy, this billionaire, is a liberal, in fact, the only thing Bill Gates has given more of his money to than Common Core is abortion and population control in Africa. That's the only thing. These un utterly unelectable, unaccountable people who put the standards together, do you think this federal government would have allowed it to happen if they weren't doing what the federal government wanted? Is that, given what you know about this current federal government, and the American federal government for the last 30 years. It's incredibly jealous of what it does. It doesn't let you do what it does. In fact, it's busy trying to stop you from doing what you do. It doesn't let you take over what it does. Do you honestly think the Department of Education would have allowed these non-educators to do this if they didn't want it done? It doesn't make you, you go ahead and not pay your taxes and see if they let you slide. You go ahead and not Buy the, if you're in an exchange state, go ahead and not buy your Obamacare. See if they don't find you. You honestly think that five people and one billionaire could have transformed American education right from Washington, D.C., under the government's nose? Never could have happened that way. And so what, she says. As a result, the standards better reflect the interests and priorities of corporate education reformers than the best interests and priorities of teachers. And how about this? It's worse than that. Uh, here's, my, here's my overview of how Common Core got here in one sentence. This is an unholy alliance between a very overreaching federal government and a very small collection of crony capitalist companies. Uh, it's not, this isn't about free market capitalism. If this were free market capitalism, given how many people despise Common Core, you would have thousands of non-Common Core textbooks flooding the market. Think about that for a second. Common Core is branding so badly that they've changed the name of the new standards. People despise Common Core so much that the science standards that are about to be unreleased, they don't call them Common Core. They've renamed them the next generation science standards. Mm -hmm. Because they figure, uh, sadly, probably correctly, that if you don't hear the words Common Core, most Americans will not think it's there. So they're renaming all the subsequent standards. That's what they've done. It is pretty shocking when you think about the, the level of deception they go through to make you con to get you convinced that everything is fine. But ask yourself this. There are so many, so almost, in fact, you almost can't buy a brand new textbook in this country that's not Common Core. Try it. Try to find a newly published textbook in the last two years in this country in any subject that's not Common Core related. You won't find that. If this was genuinely the America that you and I grew up in, given how many people don't like Common Core, don't you think there would be uncommon core textbooks flooding the markets? You can't find any. That's the monopoly. That's this crony capitalism that goes on here. 
Speaking of crony capitalism, how about this? The New York kids, remember, New York's one of those states that have had it three years longer than you. The New York kids had an interesting surprise on their last common core test that, uh, that American kids will start taking next spring. The whole thing was product placement. When the New York school, school kids sat down to take their English tests, the entire test was one big commercial for certain companies. This is directly from the Washington Post. At least a half a dozen companies got an unexpected boost in marketing their brands to New York children's this week with free product placement on the state's English exams. Teachers and students said that multiple choice section of the eighth grade tests name dropped at least a handful of companies or products, including Mug Root Beer, Lego, IBM, and FIFA, International Soccer. See, I knew it was a concern. It was a communist soccer. <laughs> soccer <here. laughs> FIFA, right? They were also mentioned in the textbook literature. Some of them with what educators refer to as trademark symbols. One teacher who proctored the exam said, I've been giving this te these tests for eight years and have never seen a test drop trademark names and passages, let alone note the trademark at the bottom of the page, said one teacher who administered the exam. Now you listen to this sentence. An educational arm of the firm Pearson Publishing. Who's creating these exams? Pearson Publishing. They are the first issued by New York State Education Department that will not be made public after they're scored. Think about that. Pearson, who's never been elected to anything. Pearson, who has no ability to be voted in or out of office. Pearson's wrote the tests, and Pearson will not let the teachers see them after they're scored. As a matter of fact, why, you can ask yourself a question, well, why doesn't the Washington Post show pictures of this? Because the tests were copyrighted, they were done all on computers, you couldn't copy them, you couldn't print them. The only teachers who ever saw them were the handful of New York teachers who had to actually proctor the exams. And they were forced to sign a non-disclosure statement. Uh. They were not allowed to talk about what they saw. You tell me, supporters of Common Core, I don't think that I doubt they're already here, but you tell me, how in the world a system like this is going to help your kids learn? So your kids fail the Common Core tests, but then your teachers can't see the questions they failed, or even begin to figure out how to answer. Is this about education yet? Let me tell you something else about Pearson Publishing. All right. How about this? Do you know that Pearson Publishing is the second largest private donor to Common Core outside of, the, of, outside of Bill Gates? Pearson is. Do you know that Pearson right now owns 100% of the Canadian textbook market? All of it, Pearson has. Do you know that in the last couple of years, Pearson's bought up about 40 different small American presses, paying five and six and seven times what they're worth? Pearson wants the same monopoly here. And do you know, about a couple of months ago, Pearson was awarded an exclusive contract with the federal government to produce and administer the Common Core test, the national level? Do you know that Pearson gets paid about 30 bucks for every single exam your kids take? What's 30 times 60 billion? It's a lot of money, isn't it? Pearson Publishing, right? That's who, and now they're getting paid Pearson. You, you think that they're plugging mug root beer and FIFA on the exams for nothing? How much do you think Pearson's rate breaking in? from these companies to put their names in the exams your kids have to take. How's that for that? And say what you will about the, the, these ridiculously uh, inveterate small group of com companies and how they're making money off this. Say what you will about them. But please keep in mind that none of this happens unless the federal government wants it to. Who's in charge of the education at the federal level? It's Department of Education. Oh, and by the way, David Coleman, remember I told you him, the guy who started all this off? David Coleman was a roommate of Army Duncan's in college. That's how he got the gig. He was Army Duncan's roommate. They shared bunk beds at their pricey Ivy League school. That, and do you know, no sooner did David Coleman, or, or architect of the standards, help write them, than he immediately left Common Core, and he became the president and CEO of the college boards, where right now he is rewriting the SATs to conform to the Common Core standards he wrote. How in the world does that happen in a free republic? The man who wrote the standards without ever being elected to anything, the man who wrote the standard without consulting any major educational organizations, without consulting state governors or moms and dads, the man who did it quietly left it and immediately became the chair of the SATs, where he is already transforming the, the tests your kids are going to have to get to college to conform to the standards he wrote. How is that acceptable? How do you defend that? Even if you support, ah, step one step back here. 
even if you think Common Core is a good idea, how do you support what you've heard here today? You can't. And that's why they'll never talk to you about this. The people who support Common Core will never talk to you about it. Here's another interesting point. There are people like me and Alice all over this country giving Common Core talks. People blanking in the country talking about this. Where are the people who are for Common Core doing the same thing? <laughs> if we're just all, and right, if we're just all tinfoil hat-wearing idiots, we should be the easiest people in the world to refute, right? So how come there's nobody doing what we're doing defending Common Core? Do you ever notice that? Who's doing it? Who's traveling the country giving you? Who's going church to church? Who's going school to school? Hotel ballroom to hotel ballroom telling you why this, they're not doing it. Well, they don't have to. You want to know why they don't have to? Because it's already the law of the land. Why should they have to? You're not getting any coherent arguments why this is good, except the same talking points. It's not federal, they're just standards. You'll have lots of state and local control, right? Those are the buzzwords. But then again, we've heard a lot of that before. If you like your doctor, you'll get to keep your doctor, right? This is gonna save every American $2,500 a year, right? You've heard the same garbage that keeps being repeated. Watch what happens. And even if you think B, that the common core standards are wonderful, how do you conscientiously support the way they were implemented? How do you support this? How do you exceed that this is the way something as important as education gets transformed by a very small group, very self-interested people? How do you justify?